Sally Morgan is trying to join the meeting. We can't get in. Is she in the waiting room? Chair, we're live now if you'd like to start the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Well, good morning and welcome to the Oversight and Scrutiny Committee. All participants are now taking part remotely and we are live streaming to you on YouTube. There will now be a roll call for confirmation that members of the committee are present. Trish, can I ask you to carry out the roll call, please? Yeah. Um, Councillor Austin. Councillor D. Cox. Present. Councillor Evans. Present. Councillor Hayes. Present. Councillor Hook, Gordon Hook. Councillor Morgan. Councillor Nuttall. Present. Councillor Parker Khan. Present. Councillor Petherick. Present. Councillor um, Councillor Swain. Present. And yourself, Chair. Thank you. I'm present. And we have apologies from Councillor Toome. Thanks very much. Right, can everybody please make sure their microphones are muted and when you're not speaking to avoid any background noises? And can uh, you please... Sorry, Chair. Sally Morgan is still trying to join the meeting. I'm sure she'll come in when she's... Uh, Thank you. Great, OK. Can you please keep any points short and do not interrupt when somebody is speaking? If you wish to comment, please raise your electronic hand and wait to be called. When it comes to a vote, if we are to roll call the Democratic Services Officer, we'll read out the members' names. Will members please say if they are voting for, against, or abstaining? Alternatively, the vote will be taken by a show of hands. We will look to have a break, if necessary, at a convenient time, some 90 minutes into the meeting, if required. If members lose internet connection, the meeting will be paused for a few minutes to allow the members to rejoin. So if we move on to the agenda, Trish, agenda item one, apologies. The only one I have it's is... Thanks uh, as Councillor Toome and, and Leader of the Council as well, Councillor Connett. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Item two, uh, the minutes of the uh, last meeting on the 9th of February have been attached to the uh, agenda. Can I have a, any questions about the, uh, the agenda, about the minutes of the meetings? If no questions, can I have a proposal that we accept those minutes, please? I have Linda Petherick uh, proposing. Can I have a seconder for that? Thank you, Councillor Nuttall. Uh, can we, through a show of hands, please show acceptance of those uh, minutes? I think that's unanimous. Are there any votes against those minutes? Any abstentions from those minutes? I see nobody indicating that either an abstention or voting against. So unanimous vote for those minutes. Item three on the agenda, declaration of interest. I have no declaration. Are there any declarations of interest that people wish to make? Nobody showing a wish to declare any interest. Public questions. There are two public questions, and though answers have been provided and sent to the person who um, raised the question. But I think in view of the fact that the two questions relate to the uh, important decisions to be made by the council about the investment in the centre of Newton Abbott, I think it would be wise or I, rise, I read out the answers to those questions so they're publicly in the, available in the public domain. So the first question, what provision of meaningful activities for the youth and disadvantaged groups does the current project plans actually offer? The answer provided by the council, it is too early in the process to be able to comment on specific activities and it is necessary to consider the proposal as a whole. The future High Streets Fund Award will enable the council to develop more detailed plans for the market quarter, which includes the Alexandra Cinema, the market hall, along with the market square. How the space is managed and used will be form part of the considerations for the plans as they are being developed in more detail. As part of the bid, uh, to the Future High Street Fund, the Market Quarter proposals included a combining and transforming the Market and Food Hall, Alexander the uh, Cinema and Market Square to include a new eating quarter, a state-of-the-art cinema, a remodeled entertainment and events venue, 
and a high quality market space. B, attracting investment in these important heritage buildings to make the market quarter a more attractive destination. Changes to attract greater footfall and increase the time visitors spend in the area, extending into the evening, and so supporting the wider town centre economy, and opening up access and making improvements to the market square to allow events to take place, including greening the area and providing seating. The second question was, have any entertainment professionals, for example, touring groups, musical acts, comedians, entertainment agents, have been approached to canvas their thoughts and opinions on whether they will be willing to use the proposed space? The, sub the answer from the council, the, the submitted business case for the future High Street Fund was produced with input and support from consultants and architects with experience of delivering similar projects across the country. When we develop the projects in more detail, we will engage with a range of future users of space to design a high quality offer as its role changes from being a separate cinema and market hall to become a more flexible entertainment and, entertain and events venue and high quality market space. An overview and scrutiny group has also been looking at the provision of cultural facilities in Newton Abbott. Their remit looks at the current provision excluding the Alexander Theatre but has included and received, uh, received seeking input from diverse groups interested in the arts, including the current users of the Alexander Theatre. The group work is ongoing and will report on how Newton Abbott can develop the basic requirements for an improved cultural quarter within the town. So that is the, um, those are the questions, two questions asked and the answers provided. So moving on. Item five, councillor questions. I have no questions posed to me. Are there any Jeff, questions? Sorry, 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 sorry. Before you move yes, on. Yes, councillor. I, I apologise uh, profusely for jumping in, but I can't get my hand to raise. So I'll work on that. Um, the, the question you just answered was sent in anonymously? Because I thought- I have no details person. of the person who's, I have no details of the actual name of the person that's sent it to uh, councillor Hook, but the, I know, having checked that the answer has been returned to whoever sent it. Thank you for that. I just wondered whether it was now the process that we don't announce who's given the, or put in the question because formally we always have, I think. The, um, there is nothing on the answer provided by the council that tells me who sent the question in. Okay, thank you. Chair, if I may, we, Chair. Yes, of course. Chair, if I may, um, we, we don't have um, individual names named in the Zoom meeting or on the form um, due to data protection. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Right, moving on to the executive uh, forward plan. In the executive meeting that uh, took place earlier this month, there were 24 items included in the executive forward plan. Um, As we now have two ONS groups, we're asking that the executive identify within each of their items, which of these um, items on their plan should allocate to each or both of the ONS groups. Um, that information will be passed back to the executive asking them to do that. Equally, there are projects on the executive forward plan which have an expiry date of 2019 so um, we'll be asking that the executive forward plan is, is brought up to date where it can be, uh, so we can have an effective uh, document to, uh, to work from. Are there any questions about the executive forward plan? I see no hands raised or questions being asked. In that case, can we move on, please? Our work programme, therefore. Are there any questions about the work programme? Are there any items on our work programme that uh, you want information on? Anything that, I've had no notification of any new items to add to our work plan. Nobody, okay. Right, in that case, can I move on to our uh, first of our executive member biannual presentation? So the first one is, is Councillor Taylor here? Is Councillor Taylor booked it? Yes, thank you. So Councillor Taylor. Thank you, Chair. Can I hand the meeting over to you, sir? Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. 
Thank you uh, for inviting me to the overview and scrutiny to committee <clears throat> today to make this uh, executive member presentation on uh, planning. As members will, uh, I'm sure, appreciate, today's planning presentation is once again set against a backdrop of considerable uncertainty for the building and new homes industry due to COVID-19. For much of the last 12 months, the government lockdown dispensation has allowed the wheels of our housing industry and its supply chains to keep turning. Sales of homes have also been kept moving, thanks to a shot in the arm for, from the Chancellor in the shape of a stamp duty holiday, an incentive which he extended for a further short period in his budget last week. But the social and economic aftershocks of dealing with the pandemic have yet to be fully registered with potential consequences for where we live, how we work, the housing we need and what we can afford. Where we do have more certainty, however, is on the question of the government's calculation for housing numbers across the country. Gone is the proposed algorithm which could have more than doubled, doubled the housing requirement here in Teambridge to 1,532 1, houses per year. Instead, there is a return to the standard formula with a rebased calculation of underlying housing need and an affordability multiplier, taking the total to just under 760 houses per year uh, requirement. Whether this multiplier will make housing here in Teambridge any more affordable is not really for us to speculate, but what I can say is that I'm sure there will be plenty of people wanting to take up a new 95% mortgage to buy a home here, and many others also who will be looking to us and the recently announced Teambridge 100 Local Authority Housing Scheme for assistance in keeping a roof over their heads. In the meantime, and, the expectation, and in the expectation that the 700, the expectation is that the 760 number will not change at any time soon, it is now go, this number is now going forward as the baseline requirement for our 20 year local plan update under part two, the allocation of sites, following the extended consultation on part one policies last summer. But before we take a closer look at the local plan update, we should first turn to housing supply matters as shown on our slide seven, as this shows two very important metrics on housing provision performance, the forward looking five year supply measure and the retrospective three-year housing delivery test. Failure to meet either of these targets by any significant margin could result in a developer winning an appeal against a planning refusal through the presumption in favour of sustainable development at any greenfield site in Teambridge, in the Teambridge Local Planning Authority area, that is. Members will, I'm sure, be aware of recent newspaper articles and email notifications reporting an over delivery of housing generally in Devon. For many local planning authorities that is the case. However in 2020 Teambridge dipped below 100% for the first time to 98% with the very real possibility that uh, unless the downturn in numbers we have experiences, experienced reverses remarkably this year the presumption rule would soon apply here. Furthermore, if housing completions continue to lag behind the housing delivery test target, a 20% buffer would be added to the local plan requirement in place of the standard 5% buffer, an increase from 760 homes to 2,280 additional homes in the local plan. Given this scenario, it is good to note in slide eight that the draft local plan update is on track for public consultation in June, when proposed new sites for housing can be assessed in a strategic and a local context, alongside our low carbon strategy to help combat climate change. A settlement limit and hierarchy review will also form part of this consultation process, sharing an understanding of how various housing sites may be linked and phased to allow for necessary infrastructure to be in place prior to occupation, while options for employment development, be that starter units in a small town or village location or strategic warehousing at a major trunk road junction can also be considered 
alongside other matters such as gypsy and traveller sites. The draft plan site options found in slide, slide nine show that the call for sites, which has been quite successful, has resulted in some 370 sites being submitted or identified for assessment for inclusion in the local plan. While many of these will have been submitted primarily for housing, following an initial officer assessment, some will have been considered as more suitable in whole, in part, or in combination for employment or for green infrastructure, such as public open space or sustainable travel corridors. Where initial assessments have raised concerns about deliverability, for instance, for minerals, topography, flooding, ecology, or landscape, Sites have been set aside for review under a HELA process, a Housing and Economic Land Availability Assessment, by a specialist panel. This panel process, um, uh, which comprised of four meetings, um, were, were completed last week, with sites now coming before the Local Plan Working Group for discussion. A sustainability appraisal stage will then inform the remaining strategic options prior to the public consultation in June. Brownfield urban capacity sites are also being assessed and are expected to make an important contribution to the local plan new housing total, either through upper floor conversions of the shops in the high street and extensions or through site redevelopment. Stories of the demise of the high street are overdone, I believe. There will always be a place for the butcher, the baker and the hairdresser in our town centres, especially in those revitalised by investment and inward migration as Exeter has proved, and I look forward to this transformation, as I'm sure we all do. Turning from spatial planning to development management, slide 10 gives some detail of the major development applications or projects that have been assessed by our planning team in the last six months, including the approval of applications for over 600 new houses on allocated sites, approval for a new through school at Southwest Exeter in Exminster, and significantly the refusal of a major scheme which failed to provide an adequate proportion of affordable homes. These six months have been a challenging time for planning workload capacity management, not only because of the high number of minor household applications that we continue to receive, pointing perhaps to residents preparing to improve rather than move in the near future, and the new disciplines surrounding COVID that officers face but also because of the high number of leaving, returning and newly recruited staff. One officer has uh, thankfully now returned from maternity with three more returning in the next few months. Must be something in the water. Four new members <laughs> are now in place, all having settled in really well, with one more arriving this week and with some temporary support for interim cover. Slide 11 shows that our Development management score on the timetable, on the timely determined, shows, <laughs> I'll start again, shows that our development management score on the timely determination of major, minor and other applications is above target on all counts, although it is acknowledged that there is a backlog of older applications, including those where an extension has been agreed, which the, TM, the DM team are keen to reduce. Priorities going forward are to support the delivery and to reduce determination and officer time through taking a tougher line with newer applications that do not meet requirements. Slides 12 and 13 bring us up to date on the Newton Abbott Garden Community and related delivery officer work with evidence gathering over the last 12 months, including connecting to nature and green infrastructure transport strategy, including bus routes and improved cross-town cycle paths and crossings, urban development site assessments, also for consideration in the local plan, and in developing a vision for the town in 2050 to take forward for public engagement. A stakeholder workshop is being scheduled for later this month, while news of capacity funding is anticipated soon, which would aid further work on garden communities, including master planning the redevelopment. Slide 14 gives us the latest picture on the district heating network proposition, which is hoped will heat in excess of 2,000 homes in Teambridge at Matford, powered by the Viridor operated energy recovery facility at Marsh Barton. 
While some resistance remains to be overcome, the saving on emissions provide a compelling argument in favour of the scheme, as does the backing of Tainbridge through a sustainable loan towards this project. The do nothing option is not an option. Slide 15 brings us to the last of the presentation, the planning team's priorities for 21-22, which aside from the local plan consultation covers link road construction starts in both Dawlish and Newton Abbott at Houghton Barton, the provision of the Southwest Exeter Countryside Park, the SANGS, the Strategic Alternative Natural Green Space, provided at Exminster uh, via SIL to maintain development close to the ex estuary and a pledge rather than a priority to deliver good decisions in the interests of the whole community. Well, who could argue with that? Finally, to advise Chairman, in the interest of keeping the presentation short as requested, I have not dwelt on last year's successes or headlines, which you'll find in slide four and five, and I hope you will take those as read. While I can advise that the two council strategy programmes for which I am the PH, namely Great Places to Live and Work and Moving Up a Gear, which are detailed in slide three, uh, are both on track. And if there is further information that members would like on these, I'll do my best to respond. In closing, Chairman, I would like to take the opportunity to thank the outgoing head of Devon Building Control, Andrew Carpenter, who is hanging up his site visit high viz for a well-earned retirement after over 40 years in the business at the end of this month. I'm sure all those who know Andrew will want to wish him well. His experienced successor, Nigel Hunt, joins us on April the 6th. Mr Chairman, members, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, and thank you for keeping the uh, presentation to the point and uh, within the time limits we ask you to do so. Are there any questions uh, for the PH from the members? I can't say, I've got a number of questions. Um, in terms of the impact of the current uh, delivery of homes, can you tell me how many homes we've have been delivered uh, last year and this year, please? Uh, the reason I ask that question is obviously the council benefits from the new homes bonus. And the question therefore is what is the impact of the shortfall of housing delivery? on the new homes bonus and what is the impact therefore on the seal payments that uh, the, the uh, district and the towns and parishes would have received? Uh, I don't actually have those those numbers to to hand uh, I'm afraid uh, chairman but I can I can get those those to you or the or the PH4 housing perhaps uh, would would like to would like to do that. I'd be grateful if you could arrange for uh, okay. that information to be provided. That'd be fantastic. Um, can you also tell us the delivery of the 100 homes that uh, the council is engaged on? The first seven homes that are being built are significantly higher in cost than the price of equivalent homes that could have been bought. Can you tell us what uh, value for money calculations take place when these decisions are being made? Um, again, Chair, I mean, that, that's really a matter for the executive member for, for housing. Uh, I know that uh, the, um, the costs have been um, uh, shown at, at, uh, at committees uh, in, the, in the run up to the, uh, the application going forward and uh, that uh, uh, they, they, the, the, the costs were, were showed to members at that point uh, under, under part two conditions. Thank you. In that case, I'll ask the question directly of the uh, PH for housing. And lastly, a further question. Again, I'm not sure if this is for yourself or the uh, PH for housing. The council has just received a cash sum from the government to provide 100 homes with uh, air source heat pumps. Can you uh, say how that, the, or where the decision will be made as where the money will be spent and how those properties are being selected? Um, I can't say where, but I can say they will be, that the money will be spent. Uh, and there's certainly um, money that would be uh, very gratefully received uh, for, for uh, um, helping with, uh, with climate change in Teambridge. Thank you for that. Are there any further questions any uh, member wishes to pose? 
I see nobody indicating. Can I thank Chair, you very much? Chair, there are sorry. three hands, three electronic I'm hands. Sorry, indicating. just as I said, that three hands popped up on my screen. So, first of all, Councillor Hook. Thank you, Chair. You must have a, um, a slow pop up, but we won't go there. Um, I know Councillor Petherick has been, uh, has had, a, anyway, moving on, moving on. Um, Gary, you, you will know that I was particularly disappointed that um, the GESP situation collapsed around us uh, a year or so ago, well, six, nine months ago, and I, I think that was an appalling and dreadful situation brought on not by Teambridge, of course, but by essentially uh, East Devon and Mid Devon. Um, and I've attended, and, and you mentioned the, the local plan working group, which is a, an essential and very uh, positive um, uh, committee. And, and I, I, th I think the work that's going on there is, you know, prob probably very, very good. And and, um, and it will all go out to public consultation, which which is absolutely right. Um, can you speculate or do say if that's an unfair question? I don't mind you saying that's an unfair question, but can you speculate as to whether there've been any gains whatsoever from coming out of guest and what we have lost because I, I'm aware of certain losses but I can't see any gains based on the, the local plan working group meetings that I've attended we seem to be covering exactly the same um, ground as we were covering under the arrangements with guest and all we've done is lost the benefits of the, the association with, with guest and and uh, the, the advice and the, the money that have come with it so I'm still disappointed that we're that, that that system collapsed what gains have there been well uh, thank you for the question uh, uh, gordon um, i'm i i am it is it, it, it is regrettable that in that the, the way that the guest did come to an end however i think now with the benefit of uh, some hindsight um, I, th I think we can see that it was probably the time for the for the parting of the ways um, we we were on we are on different uh, local plan timetables to to Exeter to Mid Devon and to East Devon and I think uh, that's reflected now on um, on on the particular direction that they are taking. I saw a recent press release from from East Devon, uh, which which showed that they are still at uh, the uh, a very early stage with with their local their local plan, and I think that might have held us back. You know in uh, um, in, in the course of us trying to um, get our get our local plan through, so I think uh, we're 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 actually lighter of foot, but we're we but we we still carry to uh, the to through to consultation uh, the 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 good work that was done by by the guest team, uh, and it, it'll be useful to to have those members who were seconded to, to, to guests back in back here in Teambridge for for the heavy lifting now that we're in, that, that we really are in the teeth of the local plan and getting this in getting the, 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 the sites forward so so I think I think uh, guest was right for its time we've moved on the time is now it's all about our local plan now I remain to be convinced but I'll listen to what you have to say Gary as always thanks very much uh, Councillor Parker Khan, please. Thank you, and um, thank you, Councillor Taylor, for your presentation. Um, something that wasn't mentioned on on your as part of your presentation, but comes across certainly my my in, inbox as a, a district council, and perhaps for many other people, is the issue of enforcement, um, where there are planning breaches. Um, and I know that there have been some significant difficulties due to coronavirus and the restrictions on site visits and things like that. Um, are we at full capacity with the enforcement team? I think there was some talk about an additional enforcement officer. And do we know when the, the business may resume as normal um, as regards site visit and enforcement cases uh, are considered? I think we all want to know when, when we can get back to normal, uh, Councillor Parker Khan. Um, as for the the enforcement team, we are actually still one down, uh, and uh, I'm sure an officer will pop up and correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, but we have been using the the uh, the, the, budget, the budgeted uh, funding that we have to support uh, that the, the enforcement team in in other ways, uh, from 
uh, from other using other other members of the department other members of the department to uh, to help fill in some of the gaps uh, it, it's a it's a it's a very it's a difficult and sometimes thankless task um, uh, in, in enforcement i've seen i've seen some some uh, things come across my desk and i know that phil our chairman has too um, but but at the end of the day it's uh, uh, much of it ha goes on um, uh, understandably uh, uh, in, in privacy and only really comes comes to uh, comes to light uh, when when enforcement uh, uh, moves perhaps to a, to a, a more legal footing or that we or that we're told that, uh, that the matter has been cleared up through a planning application uh, so so yes my apologies to uh, to members uh, and to members of the public who, who may feel frustrated by the process uh, there are guidelines on the on, on the website which are worth having a look at if you want details of, uh, of our policies and uh, and other matters so uh, so it's well worth looking at those they may help but uh, in the meantime um, I'll do my best to uh, to to help the, the, the team get to get to where it needs to be with these things Thank you. And I will say the officers are always very, very professional with what they do. So in, by no means saying that they, they're not. It's just I know that the capacity is a bit of an issue for them at the moment. Thank you, Sarah. That's very kind of you. Thank you. And I have Councillor Linda Pedrick, please. Thank you, Chair. Just a couple of questions. <clears throat> you mentioned a through school at Exeter. Does that mean primary through to high school? Yes, it does. Oh, thank you. And what does hierarchy review mean? Because I didn't understand that. So um, it's it, so it's a way of actually just stacking up what what it, what are the best options, what are the best sites. So it, you may need you may need to unlock one site to get to another site. So in terms of which is developed first, that's uh, that's. Uh, that sort of is uh, self-explanatory, I guess. Um, but uh, but 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 also it's it's how far out things are from from uh, local services or from transport nodes. So you would want to, from for the sake of sustainability, be developing uh, the sites which are you know closest to to all those facilities before you look further out uh, of of a of a town or village centre. Um, uh, or yeah, you 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 look in the in the round to see whether there are um, infrastructure require infrastructure requirements or or or, or, um, or things that would be good to help unlock uh, uh, not just housing but other but other important facilities um, and. Um, and to develop a better plan through through such through such a review. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any further questions from members of the committee? Are there any members of the executive that would like to raise a question? I'm seeing no uh, no indications of anybody wishing to speak. In that case, uh, Councillor Taylor, can I thank you again? Very erudite and very. Uh, detailed uh, response to the your portfolio and I appreciate you uh, doing that. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Chairman. Can we move on therefore to uh, item nine, the Executive uh, Member, Councillor McGregor, Sports, Recreation and Culture. Good morning, Chair. Good morning. Okay, I'm, what I'd like to do is, uh, unlike uh, Councillor uh, Gary Taylor, where there is a considerable amount of work going on, uh, my, my report will be necessarily brief. Um, if you just bear with me two seconds. Um, my notes have disappeared, so I'll try to figure out how I get those back. Okay, I'll just carry on then. Um, in terms of the um, sport leisure, uh, sorry, sport recreation and culture um, portfolio, the, the uh, impact of COVID has been extremely significant. Leisure centres have been closed, activities on hold, and that includes all our leisure centres and, and swimming pools, playing pitches, Muga, tennis, etc. 
health and well-being activities, conservation tasks and, and events in parks and resorts have all effectively been closed. There's been no income coming in through any of those sources. And uh, we now have dates for reopening and restarting of the activities. The schools are back um, as, of, as of yesterday. So that has meant that two of the sites have had a small amount of staff because schools use those sites for um, swimming and, and leisure facilities. So, so we've got a small amount of staff that have come back in to, to do that. From the 29th of March, outdoor sports, both adult and jun junior, uh, will, will be allowed. So tennis courts, golf, uh, pitches, you know, people will be able to play on the pitches. Uh, and as of the 12th of, of April, people will be able to use uh, the gyms, go swimming, uh, there'll be junior activities, family courts and, and um, family swims. So that will all be, be allowed, but it will be on the basis of restricted access um, as, as we had last year. And that is the expectation, although we don't actually have the clear guidelines outlined for each date yet. Um, from the 17th of May, group exercise, adult indoor sport will be allowed. And again, we're not entirely sure how that's going to look because the guidelines haven't been issued yet and we are awaiting those. But preparation work is being done on the basis of um, what we expect from, from last year uh, and possibly uh, you know, adjusted changes to, to increase, increase capacity. Uh, from the 21st of June, all things being equal, the, uh, all restrictions should be lifted and therefore uh, sauna and steam, changing ribs, etc. will all be open and we expect to a, a return to normal. However, normal could be normal last year where there was a restricted capacity. We don't know what that restricted capacity will look like. We don't know whether there'll still be some restrictions in place for social distancing, et cetera, or for, for cleansing, et cetera, um, and, and booking. So yeah, we, are, we are trying to prepare for that at the moment. Officers are very busy doing that, but it is mostly around preparation work for those dates that I've just covered. On the next screen, or next slide, please. Uh, the T10 programme out and about and active has effectively, the data is on hold. Uh, you'll note from the last two reports that came to ONS uh, and, and uh, other meetings that we, we are in what's called AMBER, but effectively that's because it's closed. We can't even make improvements because we can't do any activities. Um, there have been some activities going on behind the scenes with or behind the, this this program freeze, um, including the um, in step program, which was effectively a 510 people joining into a let's step together process, um, an exercise program which had 15,000 oh, sorry 15 plus million steps registered to it over the period of the of the actual program running, which is equivalent of a trip from London to Cape Town and a little bit of the way back. So from our perspective, that's a very successful participative uh, program that's carried on. Um, there are um, open space um, programs going on. We have under 18s, 60 years and over 60s, but it is very, very minimal and mostly managed um, on a, on a very, very strict COVID uh, basis. We need to review the targets for next year in light of the COVID impacts. And some of the funding that we receive is based on cert certain targets. So we'll need to, to have some time to uh, negotiate funding going forward for those um, and, and possibly assess a different set of targets and how those targets are measured. The leisure centre refurbishments are on hold, but the decarbonisation works um, announced this week uh, via the newsletter um, are to take place between March and September. It's a very strict requirement. The funding is provided on the basis that the works commence before the end of this month and are completed by the end of September. It will mean that the Lido remains closed for the entirety of the uh, season, unfortunately, but it does represent a massive improvement both in terms of the equipment um, that we'll be putting in there and reducing the operating costs as well as the carbon footprint from that particular site. And also the same applies to Newton Abbott Leisure Centre and Broadmeadow. In terms of the, um, the grant, the grant funding comes from the National Public Sector Decarbonisation Scheme um, and it reduces our carbon footprint across those three sites by an expected 280 
tonnes of carbon dioxide. That's the equivalent to 100 houses across the district running their heating on full blast for a year. So that's a significant amount of uh, uh, work towards reducing our carbon footprint as a uh, portfolio and adding to the council's overall target, which I'm sure will be covered in more detail uh, by Councillor Hook in her delivery um, on the climate change um, portfolio. Next slide, please. Um, budgets, the furlough and income compensation schemes have uh, saved a lot of money across the 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 um, the, set, the, the, um, the delivery of the, the leisure centres. And I think it's really important that we, we recognise that that has actually saved a huge amount of money for the, the council. It's covered a lot of expenses. Uh, having the leisure centres closed has reduced our operating costs. Um, but the uncertainty means that we really are hopefully going to be lobbying for uh, extension to the scheme while the uncertainty remains in place. We're not entirely sure how the scheme looks going forward from, from April, but we should have a better idea as that information is, is fed down to us. Uh, green spaces, ranges, we've, we've had income losses from the pitches, events, beach huts, et cetera, um, but we have seen increased usage by the public across parks, um, you know, walking, et cetera. And some of the work that has gone on um, within the parks has been done because you know, we are, we are seeing quite a significant increase in, in uh, public use. Cemeteries, there's been no difference um, to budget, or no significant difference to budget projections. And thankfully, um, there has been no increased demand um, despite the COVID crisis. Thank you. Next slide, please. Uh, business as usual operationally in parks and the nature reserves and resorts. The decoy play park improvement works are out to tender. Uh, that's, um, that's hopefully going to be resolved very quickly. Uh, the Baker's Park refurbishment nearing completion and the Matford Sangs phase one is also nearing completion. Um, in terms of decoy park, the um, decking uh, by the lake has been replaced. It's looking really smart and tidy. And um, once the... Um, once the play park is refurbished this year in accordance with uh, approved expenditure from, from, from last year, uh, we'll see a, a much improved facility for children um, to use and, and parents to, to bring their children down to. Um, in terms of the SANGs, we, we have that going and the phase one's completed. We are hoping that that will obviously attract more people to go out and, out and about and active. And then we will start to feed that into our T10 projections once they start to open up and, and, and ease going forward. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of leisure centres, the Team Bridge Together campaign, I, I've, I've covered that, that's the STEP campaign. On demand and live streaming programs have been offered to, to, to residents across the district. Um, I know that the staff have been in contact directly with one or two users to help them and support them through the process. Um, staff training and development activities have taken place throughout the, the, the furlough period as well. So to ensure our staff are still, um, you know, being kept warm. There's nothing worse than being out and furloughed and not having any contact. So we are ensuring that our staff are kept warm and, and um, you know, welcomed into the into the team. And, and the development activities will help improve their uh, ability to do their job going forward as well. Property maintenance has been carried out, for instance, the decking at, at Decoy Park by the lake um, and uh, various elements across the, uh, across the portfolio. We've got our, our Chartered Institute Partnerships approval uh, my notes do say that we have got two elements to that. One is partner working and the other is trainer partner working. Uh, and that's Chartered Institute approved. So it, it, it's a big feather in our cap to get that. Membership and administration and communications has been improved by, by the app. Um, and we are going to probably have uh, one or two queries in terms of membership fees that have covered during the closure period, but we'll be able to carry those going, going forward. And carbon reduction improvement bid projects, they, they have been won and they are being implemented as we speak. So all of that included, um, things are looking quite quite rosy in terms of the actual leisure centres themselves. I will say that unfortunately Dawlish didn't win out on the, the carbon reduction improvement because it already has quite a high level of reduced carbon output because it's got a biomass 
um, heating system rather than a gas, a, a natural gas boiler. Uh, redeployed staff, which is the first item, which I didn't cover initially. Um, leisure centre staff were offered to all of the other departments that required extra staff because of the extra work that they were doing. Um, I don't have the numbers that were, were actually deployed, but I suspect it was quite low because having developed their, their systems and, and processes over the um, previous two lockdowns, it actually looks like they were very, very efficiently carrying out the, the, the details in, in the last lockdown. Um, last slide, please. Uh, challenges going forward, getting leisure facilities back up and running as safely as we can. Um, it's all being lifted in stages, which is quite nice. Uh, the financial recovery will be the key, I think, um, going forward and refurbishment of centres. Um, that's not including the decarbonisation process, but the interesting aspect of the decarbonisation process is that the business case for refurbishment included renewal of some of the equipment that will be covered in that process. So we still will need to do a business case going forward, but we won't be able to do that until we see what income level and attendance level and uses level we have after the COVID crisis. I suspect some people will be nervous about coming back into crowded environments. Um, so that may impact it in the short term. But we know, for instance, that there's quite a lot of interest in getting the swimming pools back up and running as quickly as possible um, to, you know, to get in, encourage both clubs and individuals health and well-being, which brings the, the health and well-being of residents. You know, we have a fantastic set of facilities, a fantastic set of officers and, and contractors managing that process for us. And they've kept it open and tidy and a usable space that people want to use. Um, you know, having been down to Michael's Field recently, um, you know, the, the, the usage is much greater than I, I thought it would be at this stage. And people are starting to now already get out and about. Uh, we're going to be looking at funding activities in parks to get that kick started back up. Uh, and also we need to, to look at our sustainability of cost within within the portfolio as, as a part of the council. So, you know, from that perspective, the decarbonisation reduces operating costs for us, hopefully across the, the patch, uh, which then adds to the, the savings going forward into the, the coming years, um, which has, has been covered in the exec reports by Councillor Keeling. Next slide, please. And that brings me to the end. Any questions, please? Thank you, uh, Councillor McGregor. Are there any, could you take your uh, displays down? Thank you. Are there any councillors with questions for Councillor McGregor? I see no hands raised. One question, uh, Councillor McGregor. I'm pleased to see that the works at Baker's uh, Field are progressing and will be uh, completed hopefully soon. I've had a comment from the people running the air ambulance, air ambulance of concern that uh, they were given plans for the pavilion and location for the uh, their investment of putting lights for the emergency landing of helicopters, which showed the, or put the lights on the wrong side of the pavilion because the pavilion had been rotated round. Have you any feedback on that or do you know what happened there? I haven't had any feedback or input from, from uh, Devon Air Ambulance at all on, in respect of the, the lighting facility. But if that has been done, I, I would suspect that would have been corrected um, as being impossible for a helicopter to land behind a pavilion because A, a it's a slope, um, and uh, the flat area is actually further away um, on the football pitches, away from the trees. So it was, it was a flood lighting. Could I ask you to just follow up with it, the Devon Air Ambulance, just to make sure that the facility complies well, with or will meet their uh, minimum requirements? More than happy, and, and we'll drop a, a confirmation note into the members of the committee as well. That's very good. Thank you very much indeed for that. Are there any other questions? Gordon, you had your hand raised. Mute. You're on mute, Gordon. Thanks, Chair. <clears throat> Sorry, thank you. Um, first of all, thanks to, to Andrew for the, the uh, very positive presentation and report. Really, really good and lots of interesting things there. Uh, not least, of course, the decarbonisation programme, which is just fantastic news for the Council. Um, and that, that will be a big, big plus in terms of our uh, outgoings and, and uh, carbon footprint. Really, really good. That's that's. Excellent news. I'm afraid I was a bit distracted during the presentation, however, because I was trying to just clarify one or two points that I thought um, were erroneously made 
during the housing presentation and I, I got clarification and um, well, we probably can't go back to that, but, but it, it just to, to, to um, say that I may have missed therefore the answer to the question I'm going to put to you. And in that case, I apologize for giving. I think, I think we all agree across the council that we need to become more income conscious. We need to raise our, our income, not necessarily by raising costs or price charges, but by increasing participation levels. And if you get 100 coming to have a swim as opposed to 50, you're going to get 50 more incomes and, and so on. Um, I'm aware that some of our facilities, I'm thinking probably of pitches for team games and so on, were to an extent underused previously, and clearly they've been not been used during the, the, the lockdown. Are we undertaking or do we undertake promotional work to try and increase the usage of our, our pitches? Um, do we make uh, approaches directly to cricket teams or, or, or football leagues or what it might be to, to encourage and make aware our facilities? Because I, I know, that, for instance, the ones in your own, um, your own ward in Michael's Field are, are, are probably not used as much as they might be. And yet the facilities there are, are really good. I don't understand why um, they aren't being used more. And, and I'm obviously, and I'm sure you are hopeful that with the increased um, availability at Baker's Park with the new pavilion and so on, those will be even more used. Are we promoting, in other words, and how? Uh, I, I did have this very, very conversation, actually, with um, with a lead officer. Um, there, there was an article on Devon, BBC Devon Radio um, recently, and it was uh, a discussion with David James, the former England goalkeeper. Um, those who follow football probably know who he is. Though this, don't probably wondering who he is. He was a very he he, he was a very positive. Um, supporter of, of not just football, but all sports, particularly from village leagues. So, you know, from my perspective, you know, he, he made some absolutely brilliant points. We, we do have a case where we need to support, we need to use more. Um, interestingly, we, there's an organisation called St. Southwest that we're using during the summer last year, during the easing of the lockdown, Michael's Field every single day. And they had between 120 and 150 um, children uh, training uh, on those pitches at Michael's Field, which was absolutely fantastic to see. Um, it meant that actually we had to put a little bit of maintenance work into the car park because the usage got, got so high. And I don't think the car park surface had had that much usage for quite some time. Um, so we are, we are looking at usage and we are looking at how we're going to maximise that. Um, I think from my perspective, my biggest concern is that you know, where there is usage currently, the COVID crisis has impacted small clubs either with um, loss of funding or, or loss of interest. And that's actually more, more worrying in some respects because a loss of interest in, in two or three small villages, you lose a league, you know, you lose a league. So we will, we will have to um, sit down with Devon County FA at some point and talk about what they're doing to encourage uh, football, grassroots football locally, village leagues, etc. Uh, and, and find out the best way to support that going going forward. Um, and I think that also applies to rugby. It applies to cricket. Believe it or not, probably applies to the much uh, much discussed croquet pitch at um, Ford Park as well. Thank you. Uh, can I move on, Gordon? Are you happy? Yeah, that, that, yeah. Thank you, uh, Councillor Nuttall, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. This is not a question, it's just a, um, a very brief comment. Um, last week, my fellow Ken Valley councillors, uh, Swain and Foden and I, had a presentation from the team implementing, uh, overseeing the, the development of the Matford Sangs um, outside, which will be part of the Southwest Exeter development. It's absolutely fantastic. It's a very imaginative um, project and I think it's going to be a very significant addition to the green spaces in the district and I, I exhort people to come and have a look at it in the summer once it's open to the public. It, it's going to be quite spectacular. Thank you, Sean. Thank you very much. Thank well, you. I, don't, I, have, I have no other uh, committee members wishing to ask a question. Do I have any executive members wishing to ask a question? I've got... No. I just have your hand still raised, Councillor, not all. No, I have no further questions. In that case, uh, can I thank you very much indeed, 
um, Councillor McGregor, thank you for a presentation. Thanks for keeping okay. it within the uh, time limits we asked you to. That's very, just, very just helpful. Be just before I go, Chair, I just want to say that yesterday was International Women's Day. And um, I think it, 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 it behoves us all to um, thank all the women in our lives for, for the effort uh, and um, excellence they, they bring to our lives. And I think, uh, I think I'd just like to say that. Thank you. I don't think anybody on the committee would disagree with you. Thank you. Can we move on then to um, item 10, which is the report of the Employment Sites Task and Finish Group, uh, which um, was a group that I was involved with. So if you don't mind, I'll give you an update or I'll give a synopsis. I take it everybody has a copy of that uh, report and has had the opportunity to read it. Right, the principles behind this investigation was to establish, if we could, the reasons behind why Teambridge for the last 10 years or so has not delivered the sort of employment growth from new sites that we've projected and uh, wish to see. So it's really to understand the background reasons why those sites weren't coming forward. Whilst over the last, I think it's eight years, we've seen growth in employment of between six and 8,000 uh, jobs, none of those are associated with uh, major site redevelopments. So to investigate, the group was created to talk with the appropriate people and establish the opinions of um, the professionals in the, in the field to come forward with uh, things they could identify that we ought to be looking at and the things that weren't working or things that weren't working within uh, Teambridge. The group invited representatives from other councils to come and talk to us, representatives of agents of people that own or bring forward development, our own councillors. And we had a series of uh, presentations, which I found personally to be uh, very, very helpful and very uh, informative. And it was consistent in terms of the messages that they came forward with. And those observations are contained within the uh, report and summarised within the report. But fundamentally, the report identified, I think it's 11 areas of concern or areas where we believe that uh, the council should be looking to address why the work isn't coming forward, why the jobs aren't coming forward. The overriding thing, though, is that the perception was that the council lacks an overall strategic plan for the delivery of employment. And that what we actually need within the council is that sort of plan to be developed. Creating, enjoy, uh, creating high paid employment is extremely important, an imp important task for we, us as councillors. And I think uh, our, one of our primary recommendations to the executive from this report is the executive commission the production of a detailed plan to create employment. So having said that, can I go around the members here who are part of that group, Councillor Nuttall, would you like to say anything about the uh, about the report or observations of the report? <clears throat> yeah, not much to add to what you said, Chair. I think the the overarching thing for me was that, as you said, the the lack of a strategy, a strategic approach, um, which we heard from I think almost all the people we spoke to. So I think that was the overarching thing that, that I'd like to emphasise. Well, thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to make a comment about the report? Are there any questions, therefore, um, about the report or information that you'd uh, like to have or more background details on? Gordon, I can see your hand raised. Uh, Councillor Sarah Parker. Yeah, thank you. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have a few points. Um, if we started going through the report, and I think the report was very valuable, and I think, I think the members concerned who took time to produce it are to be you know, thanked and applauded for, for what's here. So what I go on to say isn't meant to be um, negative. It's, it's just to add to what's there. Uh, in, um, in two, two, one to start off with, I mean, that, that is the crux of it, isn't it? And, that, and that's, I think, what generated your interest in the interest of the, the members, that we're just not delivering employment sites. And yet in, in our local plan, we have a, a lot of sites designated for employment but they're not coming forward and as it says later on that's probably because the landowners are waiting for that to fail so they can convert to housing 
and and uh, that's singularly unfortunate. Um, it's very disappointing, therefore, that these sites haven't come forward. And I'm, I'm surprised, in a sense, that the people you've consulted have, haven't included Devon County Council, who have um, quite a large responsibility or department working on similar to our own employment generating. And, and I thought that, that was a, a, a place to, to start an, an interview. Ditto, it may have been useful to have got, say, Southwest employers or, or LEP engaged because the, these are agencies which I would have thought had a, an insight into the potential of our area and, and may have come forward with positive suggestions for uh, advancing our case. Um, so I think there's, there's a, a piece of work still to be done on, on um, essentially working border blind and across, across borders with other agencies that at the moment well, I, I, I didn't see that in, in the report. Um, it, it does say you, you held Zoom meetings with East Devon District Council and, and so on, and JLL and Tony Noon. I'm afraid I don't know who they are, but, but that's, that's my problem, not yours. Um, but I, I, I would have thought that Devon County and, and the left and so on would have been agencies that would have been worth exploring. Um, also, members will know that and I'm sure we all are very very keen to increase our income generate entrepreneurial activity um, that it's alluded to in in the report um, but not really developed at all I, I'm whipping down through the um, report here in the conclusions um, it, it talks about seven three talks about a team which needs an investment plan that focuses on the delivery of employment sites yes it does uh, but it also needs I think as a council, we need to look at ways in which we can generate income for the council. We, we just need a complete change of mindset, in my opinion, that we've got to become, as a council, entrepreneurial, not exploiting, but, but um, capitalising wherever we can on money-making, fundraising, business-like activities. I mean, I've made various suggestions in the past, and I, I would like to think that maybe this committee or, an, or a new equivalent would actually take forward the ideas of, uh, 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 that we can all bring forward, every council member, of where and how the council can become more entrepreneurial, can become more businesslike. Uh, you will know I advocated a crematorium uh, that we could build and run. I, I think that where there are new developments, um, for instance, um, on the edge of Newton Albert, we perhaps as a council could build and run the local shop that's going in there. Why not? Other councils are doing not dissimilar types of activity. And if we are concerned about improving employment on the one hand, but generating income for ourselves, I think that could be an extension of the work of this committee. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just come back and um, answer a couple of the points you make there? Firstly, the role of the committee was to look at employment sites and the delivery of employment sites. We totally endorse and agree with you about the need for a much broader perspective, which would pick up the things you're looking about at. But we're suggesting here that that should be referred back to the executive for the executive to decide the actions it needs to take. The other point I would make is that you talk about uh, Devon and the left. I agree with you. When we spoke with uh, East Devon District Council, we've had extensive workings both with the LEP and um, Devon County Council, they made the points that you actually refer to, um, or made the points of how the District Council works uh, to deliver their employment sites. And it was pointed out forcibly by uh, East Devon um, how those things should be done. And the responsibility rests back with the District Councils and how it works to overcome the issues that we were highlighting to them. So we, we felt that we had the input from the uh, people who'd worked with the two people you're talking about, even though we, we couldn't get those uh, people to come and talk with us. Jones, Lang, LaSalle, the people you don't know, the biggest um, commercial property agent, if I could call that, in Europe. And they have an office down here in Exeter, focusing on the Southwest, and we spoke with our Southwest uh, officer who looks, who actually lives in Teambridge, works within Teambridge, and uh, represents a lot of businesses looking to invest down here. 
Uh, Noon Roberts is a local commercial property agent who again represents a lot of landowners down here, specifically within Teambridge, and therefore his views and Luke Jones, uh, Lang LaSalle, gave us a spectrum of representation which covered the smallest the largest landowners and business opportunities that are uh, coming down here. It was from Jones Lang LaSalle who got this uh, requirement on their books, highlighting 1.5 million square feet of uh, industrial employment space that uh, the district needs. They also highlighted the fact that the current age of our industrial properties predominantly within Teambridge are now over 25 years old and therefore are less fit for today's use that are uh, required. And they also highlighted the, uh, the point that most opportunities currently are coming from warehousing, manufacturing and distribution, which require to be alongside the main routes. And they're not good neighbours to residential developments, that people don't want noise because these sites have to be capable of working longer than the normal working day. And therefore, it makes more sense to uh, locate these away from residential developments, hence the point of our pepperpot approach not necessarily being uh, commensurate with attracting the sort of businesses that we would like. So uh, there was a lot of um, discussion went on there, but the details are contained in here. But the principal thing is we're saying to go back to the executive to create or request the recreation of a further working party that does broaden out the responsibilities or, or, or scope to come back with the sort of things you're uh, quite rightly suggesting, um, Gordon. Um, Sarah, you had your hand raised. Thank you. Um, a really interesting report. And, and I think sometimes employment sites get slightly left to one side because housing predominates much of what we talk about, but actually vital to the, the, the health, wealth and well-being of Teambridge as a community. Good quality um, local employment is going to improve people's life chances and access to housing and all those other things that concern us most. So I think it's vital that this goes forward to the executive for broader discussion, um, a, a wider strategic approach and, and a proactive approach from the council. So I, I'd be willing to support that going forward. That's going, thank you. Um, Councillor Swain. You're on mute, and, uh, Andy. My apologies, I was so busy putting my hand down. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you to everyone that's worked on this report. Um, there seem to be some some really good ideas in here um, that, are, that are welcome. Um, I do note the lead officer's comments about the costs and resourcing of some of the ideas that are put forward, um, as we've seen from the recent budget uh, debate um, with the ongoing cuts in the central funding. There are tough decisions to be made, and the reality is that uh, putting forward a good idea means another good idea somewhere has to go by the wayside. So um, I'm, I'm cautious that uh, these ideas are, are, are balanced. Um, and I'll, I'll give you a few more examples. Um, uh, I represent a rural parish. We've had quite a few uh, planning applications come through recently for industrial development on a small scale, which I think fits with your, your pepper pot model, which you're saying is a bad idea. So I uh, agree there. Um, uh, but there have been some very contentious issues. Um, there's been a, a rural building which was disused that was um, wants to be converted to an industrial site. And the reality of that would have been uh, a significant amount of HGB traffic to a very remote rural location um, uh, accessed uh, next to a village which is accessed by narrow lanes. It was very desperately unpopular with the community. Um, and, and so, for example, conversion of rural buildings uh, isn't necessarily a policy that we need to completely pursue. Um, uh, the comment about approaching landowners by roads also is something to add to that. Um, yes, obviously there's benefit in industrial sites being by roads, but possibly is there a, a, an element of car based thinking here? Um, we, we need to move to a less car dependent society. Um, I agree absolutely that we don't want lots of small industrial sites in amongst residential developers, but we also want um, the employment sites to be not too far from residential developers, so developments, um, so that walking and cycling are realistic um, possibilities. We need traffic free routes between the residential and the commercial developments. Um, 
so you know we need to broaden the scope there slightly we need to be looking for sites by main roads that are not too far from residential areas as well as not too close and we need to look for traffic free routes i think there's some important things there um yeah those are my points again thank you very much to everyone involved uh, there's some good ideas and i do support the proposal um just pointing out that uh, some of the some of the specific recommendations need to be balanced with other requirements thank you Thank you. I think the report, when it talks about rural communities, does make the point that they must be appropriate developments. And I think appropriate encompasses all the requirements to address transport restriction, you know, access and things like that. One uh, of yeah, the, absolutely. One, but it, I think uh, the transport issues need need to be said. We need we absolutely. need to talk about car free routes and active travel and reducing yeah, one, car dependence. Thank you. One of the big concerns that came out of when we were talking to people was the of the 1.5 million square feet of space required, a lot of that was coming from current businesses that are within Teambridge, wanting to expand and grow and feeling constrained that was stopping them growing. Um, the lack of space was forcing some of these people to look beyond the realms of Teambridge to create uh, the sites where they could develop and grow. Since producing the report, we've also had the announcement that Plymouth is going to be a, a freeport area. So that's going to put additional pressure on potentially businesses, high value businesses who operate in the international market, seeking to take advantage of a free port, and then relocating to um, or down to Plymouth. And one of the concerns were that if we weren't addressing and providing resources within Teambridge, we were actually promoting greater levels of transport because people would be therefore forced to move away from Teambridge, live in Teambridge, then drive down the A38 to uh, Plymouth or potentially Exeter. So it is a difficult um, conundrum. It is a, an issue that we need to uh, live up to and recognise and, and consider how we address that. Hence our comments that we need a strategic plan that covers employment as opposed to just looking at employment sites. So it's, it is a, uh, a complicated issue that we need to get out. The council needs to get its... Um, mind around yes gordon just to elaborate on two points and um, first of all the the free port status for uh, plymouth i've asked john hart the leader of devon county council for a report on the impact of of that new status on devon and the economy of devon because you're right to point out as you do the um, the possibility of it being a magnet and taking away from but at the same breath it might also be an opportunity that we, that we um, ought to be grasping. I, I know, for instance, that the the, the Solent uh, Freeport area stretches from Portsmouth through to the New Forest, a huge area. And um, it's just possible that certain parts of Devon, I'm not saying Teambridge because I don't know, um, but it's, it's possible that the, there could be positive impact from that for us. And, and I do think that we ought to be exploring that as a, as a very real and immediate um, possibility. So that, that's that point. Um, my second point is that on, in 2.9, um, going back to what we were talking about previously, 2.9 states that the demand for new facilities is coming from manufacturing, warehousing, distribution, etc., where demand is strong. Is, uh, I'm sure that's right. So why aren't we building one or two warehouses and capitalizing on that demand? We have space for what, what's stopping us being proactive and, and su supplying that need? But it goes on to say in 2.9, um, the requirements for offices is weak. Well, that, that's an absolutely entirely different message than the one I'm getting from Devon County Council, where they are about to announce, I'm not sure I should announce it properly, um, the production of hubs for uh, sort of box and cox office use um, here in Newton, Albert, and Tynmouth. Now, you know the, the message, therefore, is is contradictory, um, and and here is where I, you know, where I'm thinking that it would have been advantageous to speak to to Devon Council, Devon County um, Direct. We we seem to be missing out on on opportunities. Therefore, I very much welcome the report and thank those who produced it, and I very much look forward to the execs taking on this and maybe giving us, you, um, the ability to progress with other uh, thinking on, on more entrepreneurial activity to generate 
a, a, a more sort of dynamic response here in Teambridge because we seem to be missing out on opportunities and I'm disappointed by that. Thank you, Chair. I, I agree with your observations. Um, so if I can uh, just move on from there, can I ask, does... Um, Or do I have any questions, please, from uh, Nina, Nina Jeffries, or anything you'd like to say, Nina? Hello. Hello. <laughs> um, uh, thank you, Chair. No, I don't have anything to add. I think the discussion has um, gone really well today, so I welcome the report coming to exec. Um, there's been lots of discussion and added bits in, hasn't there, about kind of the things that we could add to that. So. I'll bear that in mind when it comes. And if anybody's got any points that come up after the meeting, if you can just maybe email me, let me know, um, and I can bring that to exec alongside the report. So thank you everybody for the debate today. It's been good to listen to. Thank you. Uh, Fergus, Fergus Pate, I can't see your name on the attendee list, are you? I'm here. Oh, do you have any comments, Fergus? You have anything you would like to add? No, I, I don't think so. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, Gavin, Gavin, next steps about um, going to executive. My comments are in, in the report and um, I think it's been a useful discussion. Thank you. Thank you. In that case, can I come back to the uh, committee, please? Um, the proposal is this report is sent as is to the executive for further consideration in line with the recommendations that the report makes. Can I have it through a show of hands, please, that you approve of that? Sorry, Chair, can we have a seconder for that, please? Can I have a seconder yeah. for the proposal? Thank, Thank you, you, Sarah. Can we show our hands again, if you wish it to go to the executive? I think that's a unanimous. Is there nobody against that it's sending it forward? No votes against, no, abstain uh, no abstentions. That's carried unanimously, yeah, Chair. Carried Thank, unanimous. you. Thank you. Uh, I have no further items on the uh, agenda. Is there any further questions that people would like to ask? Any issues you'd like to raise? In that case, um, we're just short of our 90-minute uh, limitation. So in that case, can I call this meeting to an end, please? And uh, thank you all for your attendance this morning. Thank you. Yes.